Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins Social Innovation Lab Showcase. You are joined tonight by over 150 people also tuning in online, so welcome to our online community, and we're glad for those who have braved the rain to be with us here today to celebrate a momentous occasion. My name is Madison Marks, Director of the Social Innovation Lab, and I am extremely grateful for the opportunity to be here with you today. Welcome to our newest friends and neighbors, and welcome back to those who have joined us at this event before. This is the first live event we have done since 2019. For our newest friends, for our newest friends, the Social Innovation Lab at the Johns Hopkins University exists to accelerate emerging ventures and leaders to change Baltimore and the world. Since 2011, we've been running an intensive six-month accelerator program that provides Baltimore area social ventures the resources are required to develop into thriving, sustainable startups with a measurable impact on society and our planet. Over the last decade, we have seen more than 110 companies graduate from our accelerator, and from this number, 60% are still active, with over 70% still having a presence here in Baltimore. Collectively, they have raised over, two, uh, over 80 million with a combined venture and philanthropic funding, and have created over 280 full-time jobs. To kick off the evening, we have a brief word of congratulations from Christy Weisgill, Executive Director of Johns Hopkins Technology Ventures and Senior Advisor to the President at Johns Hopkins University. Christy, Christy has been a mentor and advisor to this program for years, and without her support, none of this would be possible. Hi, I'm Christy Weisskill, and I'm responsible for growing the innovation ecosystem here at Johns Hopkins, and what a vibrant ecosystem we have. The Social Innovation Lab, though, is not about Johns Hopkins. It's about Baltimore, a city that has been my home for over 20 years. You, the Social Innovation Lab cohort of 2022, are joining an illustrious group of changemakers. It is a joy to watch our alumni reach milestone after milestone as they grow and transform the community. The SIL teams do this in so many ways. They are feeding Baltimore. They are building Baltimore for the better. They are raising the next generation of youth. They are providing critical funding for the underserved, underestimated, and underrepresented founders. They are healing and caring for Baltimore. They are ensuring a more inclusive future. They are improving wellness. They are providing second chances. And finally, they are showcasing the best of Baltimore. You too are strengthening the fabric of this amazing city that I call home. I look forward to watching the progress of today's teams and talking about you as you feed, fund, build, raise, transform, heal, and showcase in our city. Congratulations. Just as Christy pointed out, the Social Innovation Lab alumni continue to work hard, harder and harder to better Baltimore in so many ways. And tonight, you get to meet an incredible cohort of inspiring social entrepreneurs who are joining our alumni status. The teams that we'll present tonight met back in November 2021. Over the last six months, the teams have gone through over 60 hours of education programming on everything from customer discovery to business building to impact measurement and movement building and storytelling, the result of which you'll see tonight. They have learned, questioned, reflected, laughed, and cried, and supported one another in incredible ways. I am so proud of all of your progress individually and collectively. But it's important to me to recognize that the cohort's success and progress would not be possible without the many people who have contributed time, energy, and resources to assist the teams. So first off, I'd like to thank SIL's advisors for your ongoing support of the program over the last several years. And thank you to the rich community of more than 35 experts and alumni across public, private, and social sectors here in Baltimore who contributed your time and mentorship to our teams. 
If you are in the room today and have contributed to our teams in some way, please raise your hand. Thank you so much. And thank you to the consultants, fellows, and experts who made the program possible and even smoother. And I'll note that this year, we had more alumni involved than ever in delivering our core curricula and are looking forward to further developing our program that integrates more alumni as subject matter experts in the future. But our biggest announcement this year is that we were able to provide more funding than ever before. We've heard consistently from SIL alumni that they need our help to leverage more capital to get their ventures off the ground. So this year, we launched our first crowdfunding campaign for the Social Innovation Lab. And we wanted to engage the full Hopkins community in that. And today we are excited that in addition to the $25,000 cohort prize provided by Johns Hopkins Technology Ventures, we were able to raise over $20,000 that will go directly to our SIL cohort teams. We are thankful to have local, national, and international supporters this year, and I want to provide a special thank you to our top donors this year, Hopkins trustee Dr. Charles Homsey, Hopkins alum and Baltimore native Dr. Sarah Noonberg, and Hopkins alum Mike Brooks and his wife Jessica. Thank you to all of our supporters, some of which are here with us tonight in the room and online. And I also want to recognize Baltimore Homecoming for the role they've played in directing thousands of dollars from generous donors that will be given directly to the teams. Every dollar that goes in goes directly to entrepreneurs. And you get to play a role tonight in helping put $2,500 in one entrepreneur's hands. Big responsibility, so pay attention. So that means all of you seated here and online have the opportunity to vote for the team that you would like to walk away with $2,500. But there's a caveat. It doesn't open now. It opens at 6.30. So at 6.30 p.m., you'll open your phones. On your program, there is a QR code on the back of the program. For those online, it has been sent to you. But you can go to slido.com and type in the number 0426-2022. And, and you will be able to vote. The voting will be open for 10 minutes or until we say it is closed. So you will be able to vote for one team and we will announce the winner live on the stage tonight. But without further ado, I've been talking enough, I'm not your MC. So without further ado, I would like to introduce this year's amazing MC, Dana Thomas from Happy Teacher Revolution. Dana is a former Baltimore City public school teacher turned founder of a global initiative to support mental health and wellness of educators. She's an alumni of the Social Innovation Lab Accelerator and actually won our cohort prize back in 2019. And if you could put your hands together to welcome Dana, I'll ask Dana to come to the stage. Thank you all so much. It is such an honor to be here. I'm the founder of Happy Teacher Revolution, and three years ago today, I was standing on this stage about to deliver my pitch. I was way more nervous than I am now, so I don't envy any of the folks you are about to present tonight, because it is just so, so nerve-wracking. And it was nerve-wracking even, even leading up to the process. You know, I had always dreamed of attending Hopkins. I was waitlisted when I applied as an undergrad. I got in for my master's. I applied my first time for the Social Innovation Lab, was rejected the first time. So I thought, well, I'll apply a second time. I was rejected a second time. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, third time's a charm. And I finally was accepted. And it was the best day of my life to be a part of the cohort <laughs> alumni family and truly just a incredibly community of, of folks here in Baltimore who are making social impact and change. I started as a Baltimore City public school teacher and realized firsthand the lack of support and preparedness for the emotional demands of the job of being an educator and leaned full into Happy Teacher Revolution and with the support of winning the Social Innovation Lab three years ago today, we were able to make tremendous growth using that funding of the last three years. We launched not one, but two new programs to support mentors of revolutionary educators in our community. We also launched our Train the Trainer program. So now there are trainers 
training their own group of support group leaders around the country and around the world. We also were selected by the John Hopkins Carey Business School to be the focused business for their human design thinking class and to have not one but two classes of Hopkins Business School students supporting us with our real-time challenges in the midst of a global pandemic was huge. I never got my MBA. This cohort was my crash course in business and social impact and graduate studies around making that impact. And with the mentorship and support through Hopkins, we were able to start the Happy Teacher Foundation, a scholarship organization that subsidized the cost and offers scholarship for folks who want to be a part of the program. We also expanded across Canada. We have educators in Kuwait, in Brazil, and again across the United States. And what is even more exciting is the collaboration opportunity with other SIL ventures. We actually went into business and partnership with Ashley Williams, formerly Infinite Focus Schools, and now CLIMB, to help impact not only staff mental health and well-being, but student mental health and well-being across Baltimore and beyond. So let's have some fun tonight. I just want to say thank you to everyone who is here. Thank you to everyone who is online. Your presence matters. You are a part of this community. And again, this is only the beginning of the ripples of impact across Baltimore, around the country, and around the world. Today, I'm so honored for being your MC. But before we get started, I do have a few housekeeping items. So first, bathrooms. Bathrooms are located across the hall outside of the conference center. Um, and if you could please be aware around reducing distractions so that if you do need to step out at any point, please feel free uh, to step out into the atrium. We kindly ask that you move during transitions between speakers instead of in the middle of a presentation, unless in an emergency. With that said, we are going to get started with introducing the teams in this year's Social Innovation Lab cohort. The teams' missions tonight are diverse and include encouraging healing through movement, ensuring access to period products and breastfeeding for all, creating social change and job creation through art, and helping to reduce arrest-related deaths. We invite you to listen carefully tonight. This is the beginning of a conversation. If something piques your interest tonight or you have an idea of an organization or person that might be helpful to one of these teams, we encourage you to take action, whether it's following, liking, engaging in whatever capacity possible, please know that you are a part of this movement. Reach out. Like tonight's theme, ripples of impact, small things can lead to extraordinary impact. You will also have the opportunity to make a small ripple of impact on one time by voting in the Audience Choice Award later this evening. This did not exist when I competed in the Social Innovation Lab, so this is so huge. And the fact that this prize money is going to our, our social innovators with no strings attached is so awesome. <laughs> I can't, like, I, I practice not crying during that part because it's just so huge. Um, so just please know that this is, again, the beginning of an exciting journey. Our first speaker that we will hear from tonight is Glass Recovery and Sustainable Systems Baltimore, also known as Grass Be More. Let's put our hands together for Dante. Right. Afternoon, everybody. You know that big white smokestack downtown? Well, that's our trash incinerator, and it's been spewing millions of pounds of toxic pollutants into our air every year since 1985. In fact, most of the material that goes there is recyclable, reusable, or compostable. Your organics, your metals, some plastics, and nearly 18,000 tons of glass. And since most of that material is recoverable, we are literally burning money every day, losing at least $545,000 in glass value every year. In total, we are losing $40 million of value. Now, glass is an infinitely recyclable material, but only 15% is recovered in Baltimore. And even that 15% is kind of sketchy because a lot of that glass gets collected mixed in single bin recycling. And that ultimately minimizes the reuse options. So that glass winds up in landfills or in road construction 
and we environmentalists call that downcycling. Boo. <laughs> but upcycling glass is yay. It, yeah, because it maximizes the value of that material. When you recover glass and reuse it, uh, you save energy, cutting down on CO2 emissions. And for every thousand tons of glass you recycle, you create eight jobs. Now that doesn't sound like much, but consider it takes 10,000 tons of material incinerated to create one job. And right now, no other businesses in Baltimore City recover glass directly from restaurants for local upcycling. So enter Grass Baltimore, where our motto is reclaim, reuse, rise up. We reclaim bottles from restaurants and residences. We reuse turning those bottles into artwork and cleaning others for new beverages. We rise up hiring residents from Westport, home to the incinerator, and developing young POC entrepreneurs. But we also will be an exhibit space for artists, sculptors, musicians, and the like to sell and perform their work. Grass will pick up glass weekly from restaurants and have drop-off services for residences. Bottles will come in like this and leave like these and these. My name is Dante Swinton and I've been an environmental advocate in Baltimore since 2015, working to close that very trash incinerator. My main focus has been closing that disconnect between environmental and economic justice. Uh, if you reuse, recycle, and compost that material, simply changing the way we throw stuff out can create thousands of jobs for Baltimore. Think of the impact of at least 2,000 jobs that are living wage for this city simply because we're throwing things out a little bit differently. And I have an excellent team that has experience in developing cooperatives and working with reclaimed materials. The bulk of our revenue will come from glass art, but we'll also garner revenue from artist-based rentals and glass working classes. Here's our five-year outlook. 2023 will be our first full year of operation and we'll hit profitability by 2024. Our main impact, impact metrics are on enhanced sustainability of the restaurants, the number of artists that are increasing their earnings from renting space from us, and diverting glass from the incinerator. Every day I'm fundraising. This year, <laughs> we have a goal of $28,000 and we are 71% of the way there, folks. We are so close. I am very excited about that. So, join us in upcycling glass. That funding will go towards purchasing glass working equipment, covering salaries and utilities and the like. Looking back, uh, Grass was first workshop in March of 2020. We all know how that turned out. Uh, but fast forward to the fall of 2021, we started the Innovation Works Boost Program and the Hopkins Social Innovation Lab. And in January, we started the Innovation Works Six Month Accelerator. Looking forward, we're gonna do a website revamp, uh, launch more proofs of concept out for sale, and Grass is going to launch officially in August of 2022. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> and then we will relocate to our long-term home in March of 2023. So connect with us, here are our socials, and reclaim, reuse, rise up with us. Thank you. My name is Tide Courtney and I'm the founding director of Ballet After Dark. This is me 10 years into my healing journey. In 2012, I crawled out of the woods after surviving a rape. I was battered and broken and the people I thought that would be there for me, therapists, doctors, friends, they left me feeling hopeless. I didn't want to be here anymore and I have the scars to prove it. Trauma can affect us physically and leave us feeling disconnected from our bodies. I needed a community to heal with, and I was searching for a support system of women with similar experiences that looked like me, black women. Nationally, 17% of black women will experience intimate partner violence, according to the National Center on Violence Against Women in the Black Community. According to the Baltimore Behavioral Health System, 42% of Baltimore adults and 56% of Baltimore children will experience trauma. 
These numbers are shocking, and my personal experience understanding the impact of trauma led me to create Ballet After Dark. Ballet After Dark was born out of necessity. We're an organization that provides trauma-informed dance therapy, holistic resources, and somatic interventions to black youth and women impacted by trauma and violence. A survivor's journey with Ballet After Dark begins with registration and then screening. If accepted, they'll be enrolled into the Black Swan Dance Therapy Cohort. Once enrolled in our six-month program, survivors will receive a cohort box with their uniform, workbook, and mini stationery kit. Over the next few weeks, they're introduced to dance technique, socio-emotional wellness strategies, and fundamental financial literacy. This is Jennifer. In 2018, we explored providing dance therapy resources to the community before being awarded a seed grant to pilot our dance therapy cohort. We also caught the attention of Queen Latifah and consumer conglomerate Procter & Gamble, and a short film was produced. Ballet After Dark premiered at the 2019 Tribeca Film Festival and has since had two television network premieres and is still in festival circulation. We also launched new programs, including Balt uh, Ballet After Dark Performance Ensemble, Aqua Ballet, and also our Ambassador Program. Our program is supported by grants, donations, and fundraising campaigns. We've been approached by multiple organizations for partnerships and collaborations, including Hotel Revival, uh, Me Too Movement, Brown Girls Do Ballet, and Baltimore County Department of Social Services. Our team is led by myself. I'm a graduate of the Baltimore School for the Arts Dance Department with over 20 years of training. I'm a dance educa uh, educator and professional performance artist. I'm a recent recipient of the United Way Changemaker Challenge. We're supported by an advisory board of community members with backgrounds ranging in medical and arts advocacy. We've provided resources to 220 survivors, we've raised over $60,000, and we have an 85% completion rate. Based on conversations with survivors in and outside of Baltimore, we know that the interest in trauma-informed dance therapy is much wider than anticipated. Healing should be an affordable and accessible option for everyone and not just a luxury for most. Recognizing the growing demand for this unique resource, we're launching the next phase of accessible dance therapy leveraging technology. Bad Studios is a web and mobile-based platform that will encourage anyone to heal their bodies using trauma-informed dance. We intend to generate revenue by offering a subscription-based platform providing basic to premium content, live events, trainings, and apparel. Our two-tiered subscription platform will allow clients to make one-time purchases or become a monthly subscriber. Compared to our competitors, we offer a human-centered, diverse platform with a social impact. Additionally, revenue will support the Ballet After Dark program. We were awarded a grant to begin working on the prototype of Bad Studios. We hired a production team and we are creating an advertising campaign for Bad Studios. We're asking for $100,000 to complete the, to complete the uh, prototype of, for Bad Studios and to provide uh, and to support operations and staff of Ballet After Dark. The demand for healing is growing rapidly and we have an opportunity to contribute to Baltimore's efforts of being known for hope, happiness, and healing. Join me in helping community members reprocess, rebuild, and reclaim relationships with their bodies following sexual trauma and violence. Survivors don't want to just survive anymore. We want to thrive, and we need your help to do that. If you're interested in learning more, please connect with us. My name is Emily Fleming and I am the founder of Yoga in Classrooms and Schools Consulting. At 22, as a Teach for America Corps member, I moved to Chicago straight out of college with no prior teaching experience and I was teaching special education on the west side. 
As a new teacher and as a teacher of many students with emotional disabilities, I spent that year trying to build relationships with students, find my voice, and manage challenging behaviors, all while trying to bring our most struggling learners up to grade level. I relied heavily on my own yoga practice to get me through that year, and I brought yoga into my classroom as a way for all of us to relieve stress, calm down, and self-regulate throughout the day. It was there that I saw a need and my vision solidified of bringing yoga to all kids in all schools as a means of helping our youth navigate the transition to adulthood, a transition that for many youth in our country is often a hard one. We know that youth nationally are experiencing a mental health crisis and the pandemic has only exacerbated this problem. Since the pandemic, we've seen an increase in the number of kids going to hospitals for mental health challenges, and many youth report that the pandemic has made their mental health worse. Looking at Baltimore, mental health ranked second as a priority among most stakeholder groups in a 2020 survey on student wholeness sponsored by Baltimore City Public Schools. In schools in Baltimore and beyond are turning to yoga and mindfulness as a means to address student social emotional needs. This often looks like outside providers coming into schools to provide short term and ad hoc programming, or it looks like teachers implementing a plug and play curriculum in their classroom that doesn't take into account student or school based needs. So I eventually left Chicago and I moved to Baltimore to pursue my dream of teaching yoga to kids and schools. I've spent the last seven years teaching yoga as a daily class at a middle school here in Baltimore. And when I first moved here, I was looking for a plug and play model to use in my classroom, but I couldn't find one that was a good fit for my urban middle school youth. So I actually created a curriculum of my own focused on empathy, social awareness and self management. And it was this experience that led me to found Yoga in Classrooms and Schools Consulting. At Yoga in Classrooms and Schools Consulting, we work with schools and districts to create tailor-made long-term yoga and mindfulness programming for students, staff, and families. We do this through a model of long-term coaching and support, cross-curricular integration, and the creation of culturally relevant programming that is aligned to the needs, values, and goals of the school community. Our goal is to work with schools to create school specific programming that aligns across grade levels, content areas and divisions and to provide long term coaching and support for school staff. We know that a customized curriculum can provide immense value to schools because school leaders like my principal Matthew Ebert have seen it work. We also know that yoga and mindfulness work for our students. I recently conducted a survey of my seventh graders to better understand how yoga helps them cope. And out of the seventh graders who completed the survey, 85% indicated that they were more able to regulate their emotions during the semesters when they were taking yoga than in the semesters when they weren't taking yoga. Similarly, a student had this to say about the impact that yoga has had on their life. Before I had yoga, I didn't know how to calm down or anything, but after I had yoga and learned some things, I realized it is easier to calm down or fall asleep or to get energy. The US K through 12 education system spends between 21 and $47 billion each year on social emotional learning programming. Over the next five years as a full fledged team, we believe we can capture over $1 million of that market supporting schools across the country. Thus far, we have developed our curriculum, been accepted into the Social Innovation Lab, and incorporated as an LLC. We are currently enrolling schools with the goal of having five schools enrolled over the next two, two years, and with the intention of launching a digital platform to better help us get more traction. My name is Emily. I am the founder, and I'm a certified educator and yoga teacher for both kids and adults. I've taught in schools in both Chicago and Baltimore, and I've supported kids yoga teachers who are bringing yoga to schools across the country. Our ask today is to connect us with any school or district leaders you know by sending them to our website to book a free 20 minute introductory call. Thank you. Welcome our next team, Fem Equity. Let's put our hands. 
hands together for Abigail. Thank you for the warm welcome. So I am so excited to introduce my friend Maribel. When I met her, she was a woman looking for access to success. Maribel was born and raised in New York. She was a first generation Latinx college student. And when she had finally graduated top of her class at American University with her master's degree, she thought she made it. She was ready to achieve her goals and have access to success, make her family proud. All that stopped in 2020 because of COVID-19. Because she was living with her elderly aunt, she could not work in person. She could only work in a virtual environment to keep her family safe. Because of this major shift, it caused her to leave her current place of employment and become underemployed. And soon went on to have extreme financial hardships. Unfortunately, she was going through all of that and realized she was significantly underpaid at her new place of employment. Economic policy states, women of color have on average a 60% pay gap, which equates to $1 million lost compared to their white male counterparts over the course of their lives. Approximately 60 million black and brown women are underpaid, which creates a massive pay gap totaling to $500 billion lost over the course of a 40 year work period. Giving us the harsh reality of being underpaid, overworked, yet underestimated. During these trying times, Maribel felt alone. I felt alone, black and brown women felt alone because that dream job that I showed in the first screen is not as accessible to us. What if Maribel had the resources? Gained the support, reinforced her confidence. That is why Fem Equity was created. My name is Adiola Ajani, and me and my amazing co-founder Chidero Bucci had designed Fem Equity, the first digital coaching website designed for women of color that provides resources, support, and confidence needed to secure professional and financial destiny starting here in Baltimore. Since the beginning of 2021, Chidera and I had the honor of meeting Maribel and created a beta pilot with her and nine other amazing women. They tested our services and they used our paid tiered membership model. For $15 or more, we provide access to a membership, private coaching, a self-paced curriculum, and access to other resources in our career hub. What differentiates us from the crowd on the screen is we provide not only personalized coaching, but we are the only platform to integrate both financial education and coaching and resources so our black and brown members receive longer term results. Due to the success of the pilot, my co-founder Chidera and I were so proud to now be here at SIL and share our unique experiences with, uh, with nine of the other amazing life-changing businesses and teams here. One month later, Fem Equity has secured our first paying client partner with Jubilee Arts. Plus, we secured additional partnerships with Baltimore companies like Be More Empowered, as well as SIL alum Pivot, a well-known woman prison reentry program in Baltimore. So once it was the beginning of February, I just decided to leave that raggedy job and decided to fully focus on Fem Equity and our Know Your Worth crowdfund because we amplified the message of Maribel and other stories from the Fem Equity community. In under 45 days, we raised over $7,000 from 20 supporters. And because of the support from my SIL family, the Fem Equity community, and the crowdfund donors, it landed us an additional opportunity to be a part of JP Morgan's Tech Store Catalyst program that started, that started this past March. So, <laughs> <laughs> so throughout the past 15 months, we were still working with members like Maribel, who to date collectively used their career resources and coaching to gain $18,000 in salary raises, our extensive community network led 80% of our members to positions in their field of study, and over $20,000 eliminated because our members took opportunities of government, state resources, and shared that in our Fem Equity community. 
I want to take this time to clap for them because. <laughs> yes. So Maribel had now transitioned from loss to gain. And now that I have shared Maribel's journey, I'm going to invite everyone to take out your phone and scan this QR code. Take out your phone, y'all. <laughs> Click on the top link, and this will take you to our pay gap calculator. This special access pay gap calculator, not only does it show where the gap may fall for you as women, but men. This calculator is reverse engineered, so you can use it too. Equity for women is an issue, but imagine what it would look like if everyone took action and put an end to this tragic gap that affects many women and families daily. So take action today and sign up and take one step further and send the code to someone who might be going through what Maribel had went through. We wanna help. We are also opening up our membership this, um, this soon in July. So definitely, you know, scan the code and send it to someone. And together, let's make access to equity and opportunity possible for women in BIPOC in Baltimore and beyond with Fem Equity. Thank you. Our next team to present is Enigma Science and Technology. Let's put our hands together for Malik. Good afternoon, everyone. It's impossible to forget what caused a protest in 2020. The public outcry across our nation and what caused a large percentage of our population to have the same sentiments as this individual, the same sentiments that I had. The death of George Floyd impacted all of us and his murder was categorized as an arrest-related death. And arrest-related deaths happen more often than you think. When the Bureau of Justice Statistics was still collecting this data at the federal, state, and local law enforcement level back in 2016, they estimated an average of 135 arrest-related deaths per month. That's per month. With a number that large, it makes you want to think or look into what actually causes an arrest-related death. That can be broken down into three main causes. Underlying medical condition of the individual taken into custody, substance abuse, and excessive use of force. Now with having this understanding as to what can cause an arrest-related death and the frequency that these incidents may occur, why does this still keep happening? Let's look at our current situation. We have more than 800,000 law enforcement officers across this nation, millions of arrests that happen every year, but we noticed something. We noticed consistency in every one of those arrests. It's the information. The information that is reacted to in real time. Each officer makes judgments based on what they see and hear. But their actions may differ based on their experiences. And sometimes that information is not trusted which now makes all of this subjective. And in situations like this, that rapid decisions need to be made in challenging environments, we need objective information and assessments, not subjective. Which is why we're developing a real-time decision aid for law enforcement that will provide that objective assessment to reduce the likelihood of arrest-related deaths a novel tool that will provide a series of alerts to inform law enforcement when their tactics need to be adjusted and also have the ability to notify their support team if the situation becomes dire. Now the details of how we're actually doing this is proprietary, but we are more than willing and happy to sit down with any of you to discuss the details in private because this is what we do at Enigma Science and Technology. We bring the science and tech to the forefront of solving these types of challenges within our country because we exist to save lives, livelihoods, and build back trust within our society. 
And our customer base is law enforcement, and it is sizable. But we're focusing in on the United States first, targeting specific areas that had prominent arrest-related deaths to help us broadcast our capability across this country. And this is our process, and this is our progress that we've had to date. Starting in 2020 with the creation of our solution right after the arrest-related death of George Floyd. Then in 2021, winning the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Labs Archimedes Award, getting the patent filed on our concept, becoming a full-time founder and CEO, and joining Social Innovation Lab. And then in 2022, signing off on a license agreement with Johns Hopkins, joining the Conscious Venture Lab, conducting multiple customer and stakeholder discussions, and now starting the process of prototype development and testing. And moving forward, production, marketing, and sales. And this is our team. My name is Malik Little. I'm the founder and CEO of Enigma Science and Technology with a background in engineering. Anju Little is our medical advisor with a background as a registered nurse. And Dr. Galen Shi is our medical research and evaluation lead with a background as a medical doctor. With our team's experience and the partnerships that we have, we're going to make this happen. But we need your help because what we're doing has a cost. But status quo costs even more, and the impacts are grave. Not too far from here a few years ago, we had an arrest-related death in this city. And we saw how it impacted this city, this state, and our country. So if you have an interest in what we're doing, if you want to learn more about what we're doing, if you want to help out, connect with us so we can work together to save lives, livelihoods, and build back trust within our society using science and technology. Thank you. Thank you, Malik. If you are interested in supporting or having a conversation around this important topic, please be sure to see Malik afterwards. Okay, audience. We are ready to rock and roll. I am so excited for this next piece in the showcase. I'm sure you are all tired of sitting down, so don't worry. You will soon be on your feet. Join me in welcoming SIL alumni spread karma team to the stage to get us on our feet and moving before we resume the second half of tonight's presentation. So please welcome to the stage, Kelly Ann Sherman. Woo, woo, woo. Good evening, good evening. All right, SIL family, let's all get up. We're going to do 15 burpees. No, um, yeah, but good evening. We are extremely excited to be here. And um, y'all can get y'all stretching now. It sounds like y'all know we're about to do some movement. But before we do that, we wanted to just introduce ourselves, our brand, and thank Madison and the cohort for uh, inviting us out today. My name is Kelly Brown, and I'm CEO and founder of Spread Karma. And I'm Sherman Barksdale, I, and I'm the COO and co-founder of Spread Karma. Yes, and we are alumni. We, we have graduated last year virtually. We probably have not met any of our cohort in person <laughs> still. Um, yeah, and I recognize people better virtually than with a mask on. So if y'all are out there, nice to see and meet y'all. Here uh, goes what? So we're just glad to be here in person with you all. A little bit about Spread Karma briefly. We are a social impact fundraising platform. We care deeply about connecting funding to social entrepreneurs and change makers. We launched in the middle of the pandemic, and since then, we've been in two very impactful accelerators in the city, raised over $100,000, $150,000 for change makers and their impactful causes, we've launched the uh, Spread Karma Foundation to, to not only provide a platform to 
fundraise, crowdfund, which it sounds like some of you are doing, but also to start teaching our change makers how to fundraise, how to tell their story, leverage their comrades, and then go out there and make an impact. So that's what Spread Armor is about. We bring the crowd together, and it's crowdfunding, and we put a fun in fundraising. Hence why y'all are standing up. So, without further ado, we're going to do something called Harambe with you all. And this is a key swahili term that's, that means let's pull together, right? Crowdfunding is about pulling resources together. Harambe is about pulling energy together. And, and in this room, there's a lot of energy. We're all here for a common goal to make Baltimore better. So, we're going to teach you what the next question is, all right? It's a part of Harambe. Partner change you. Yes, I got you. So this is the magic question. SIL family, how y'all feeling? <laughs> All right, I love the enthusiasm, but we have an answer for that. It's a magic answer, okay? And how you respond, you'll say, fantastic. Mm -hmm. What is it? Right hand first? Yeah. yeah either one. But fantastic. Terrific. Terrific. Great. Great. All day long. All day long. Nice. One more time. Fantastic. Fantastic. Terrific. Terrific. Great. Great. All day long. All day long. Stop, stop, stop. Stop, stop, stop. And then we, whoa, we matrix. And we say, whoa. <laughs> whoa. So, so I heard Madison say there's 150 people online somewhere. Is it right there? Yeah. All right. Y'all yeah. have it? <laughs> got it? All right. I think they got it. They got it. I think they got it. All right. Uh, you want to ask the question? Yes. Y'all ready? You ready? Let me say, oh yeah. Oh yeah. You ready? All right. SIO family, how y'all feeling? Fantastic. Terrific. Great. All day long. Stop, stop, stop. Whoa. So they said. Y'all weren't loud enough. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a little bit louder. Spread the internet with this one, okay? All right, let's try one more time. Let's give a little bit more energy, okay? All right. SIO family, how y'all feeling? Fantastic! Terrific! Good great! All day long! Stop, stop, stop! Whoa! Let's bring it back the other way. Whoa! Slow motion now. Whoa. Whoa. to empower social impact leaders to cultivate aliveness where they work, learn, and lead. Not sure what cultivate aliveness means? Good, we're excited to show you. Let's try something. Raise your hand if you are someone who tries to make a positive impact on the world. 
or if you work for an organization with a social mission, or if you've ever been part of a change initiative, but it was ineffective or unsustainable. Keep your hand up if any of that can feel overwhelming, exhausting, or isolating. Yeah, that's a lot of hands. <laughs> Making real, lasting change in the world is hard, and it can be even harder within our own organizations, which are often fraught with their own issues. It's no wonder so many of us are feeling this way. And it doesn't help that our change strategies are outdated. We live in a society that treats people and organizations like machines. So the most common approaches to making change tend to be to try to fix, optimize, or repair. But humans aren't machines and we're not broken. This is where Loam comes in. Our solution is a holistic approach to leading change that feels more human. We're a learning center and a consultancy, and we facilitate deeply supportive learning and growth experiences for individuals and organizations who recognize the need to work, lead, and make change differently. And we care a lot because like many of you, we've experienced the challenges of social impact work. Sam and I each spent a decade working at the intersection of social and environmental issues and struggling with fatigue and frustration. That led us to study how to equitably design and implement sustainable change. Through LOAM, we're striving to share what we've learned and to leverage our privilege as white women to support the amazing people who are doing social impact work. Here's how we do it. LOAM offers online and in-person education, customizable consulting services, and leadership development opportunities all at a sliding scale. And we offer low commitment starting points such as social gatherings and introductory workshops. Simply put, our goal is to have fewer people raise their hands when we ask them if they're feeling exhausted, overwhelmed, or alone. Remember when we said that our mission is to cultivate aliveness? Well, this is what we mean. Resource resilient leaders, trusting collaborative teams, and thriving organizational cultures, all with the ability to scale their impact from the inside out. We pride ourselves on being different because we know that the old ways of working just don't work. Here's how we do it at Loam. We teach systems thinking frameworks to connect the dots between individual, organizational, and large-scale change. We emphasize collaborative design to surface the wisdom of the group. And we foster community and do most of our programming outdoors because we know the value of connecting people and place. We have a lot of amazing peers in our industry, but we're the only practice integrating all four of these methods. And we know we're in the right place to be offering our services. Baltimore is abundant with people and businesses that love this city and want to see it thrive. We rank number nine in social enterprise ecosystems, and we're home to 19,000 nonprofits with 37% reporting they're able to invest time in staff development. Nationally, we will spend $59 billion on personal development, organizational consulting, and change management. We want leaders to invest that money in approaches that really work, and Loam has been building a uh, business to invest in. Since 2018, we've been developing our programming and piloting our consulting, all while working full-time jobs. Just four months ago, we officially founded our business and began to grow. And we've already made an impact. This quote is from a workshop participant, and it expresses our deepest purpose, to empower people. And we've got plans to keep doing it. This year, this year, <laughs> this year we'll be expanding our courses and building a virtual platform. In the next year, we'll be rolling out our leadership programming, and within five years, we hope to expand our consulting team to a worker-owned collective. Today, we, can, we need help getting there from you. We're asking for $26,200 to support equitable and affordable uh, services and programming for leaders in Baltimore. Uh, we, we're also hoping to grow our network and build new partnerships. Uh, you can email us directly or follow us on Instagram if you'd like to connect. And this summer, we'll be in partnership with Discover Charm City leading hikes in Baltimore. If you'd like to join, follow us on Instagram. If you're curious about Loam, we would love to meet you. Let's grow together. Thank you. Casey, I'm feeling so inspired. I would love to join your hike this summer. So 
I hope there's some more folks in the audience who'd like to join me as well. I bet there are people who would definitely like to connect. Our next team to present is the Puzzling Disorder Project, an initiative of HGP Design and Let's put our hands together for Nikki. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to Roman Xavier. He was diagnosed with autism at age three. He communicates through kinesthetics, or what we know as body language. He often experiences sensory overload. Sensory overload can cause autistic children to respond differently to what we feel are normal amounts of light or sound. It can cause some to engage in self-injurious behavior, such as headbanging or running into objects. This is commonly known as sensory seeking. The sounds that you heard during these slides, you usually don't hear. Fluorescent lights humming or feedback. Those sounds can push children into sensory overload. This is sensory seeking at age 15. Roman received these bruises after running through this wall. This was one day, the third incident of the day, with one child, my son. Roman, however, is not alone. The CDC reports that one in 49 children in Maryland and one in 44 in the United States are affected by autism spectrum disorder. I am Nikki Stokes. I am a mother and advocate. And two months ago, I transitioned from a 15-year career with Baltimore City Fire Department. I am now the Resource Center Coordinator for Pathfinders for Autism, which, one of, which is one of Maryland's largest autism organizations. I was appointed to the Governor's Advisory Board for Autism-Related Issues in Maryland. I am a certified crochet instructor and knitter, and I am the founder of HGE Designs. I never had any plans to own a business. My math was very simple. If I had co-pays and wall repairs, I had to sell and make really nice scarves. Creating was therapy for me as a caregiver, but I soon discovered that the stitches, the yarn, even the fibers that I was using mimic the tactile and sensory tools that he had access at school. With the onset of COVID, he no longer had those tools, and neither did his classmates. Additional problems facing our families is that ASD goes hand in hand with complicated health issues. That means more frequent and longer hospital visits. Pediatric ERs utilize two main tools when managing those behaviors, hospital security and empty unpadded hospital rooms. And those behaviors in our community can lead to dangerous and sometimes deadly interaction with law enforcement. The Puzzling Disorder Project is our solution. It is an outgrowth of HGE Designs where we offer sensory and kinesthetic support to autistic children through functional fashion and sensory kits. Functional fashion in the form of weighted scarves and lap pads and customized kits with calming tools on the go that will help our children self-regulate. Our target market are the families of these children, first responders and organizations with mobile crisis units, emergency rooms, clinics, barbershops and one-day stadiums. Our journey. So what began solely as a financial resource for our family gave us the opportunity to purchase iPads for Roman's classmates. We built a sensory room. I'm an Elevation Award alumni and BGE grantee. And in 2021, we had $7,300 in direct sales and we donated $3,000 worth of products to our families. Our business model is we are a direct sales business. It is our goal to expand our line, hire self-advocates interested in fiber arts and provide art therapy for caregivers. We have amazing partnerships with all minority, women, and or disabled business owners here in Maryland. Our ask is in three parts today. We ask that you support and share our existing product line. We're seeking design feedback from autistic community members, and we're also seeking your financial support. We're asking for $50,000 to complete kits for beta testing, organizational development, hire part-time makers, and marketing. Our impact. Autistic children are not the only ones that experience anxiety or even sensory issues. So we're creating a sense of community with these inclusive spaces. We can impact the stigmas around behavioral and mental health, and we can even piggyback on the 911 diversion programs being implemented in Baltimore currently. And we can impact legislation to help support additional resources for autistic children. You can connect, purchase, or donate with us online via social media or our website. And we'd like to thank you from HGE Designs, creating healing one stitch at a time.
good night to you. Thank you so much, Nikki, for sharing how your passion turned into a business and what an incredible opportunity for families and businesses to get on board with. Our next team to present is Boober, an initiative of reproductive justice inside. Let's put our hands together for Kim. The sweetest smell in the world is the scent of a newborn baby's head. And when that infant is placed on its mother's breast, it instinctively knows her sound, her touch, and her taste. But not for women like Charlotte. Charlotte is an incarcerated mother, and she gave birth alone. And in 48 hours, she knew that she was going to return to the cold, steel, concrete prison cell. There are 1.7 million mothers in prison. In 2020, Maryland saw 23 babies born to mothers behind the fence. I want you to sit and be uncomfortable for a minute. And by the time I'm done, I want you to care. My name is Kimberly Haven, and I am the Executive Director of Reproductive Justice Inside and the founder of Boober. I am also the only formerly incarcerated individual in Maryland who has written policy that's gotten passed into law. And I and I do what I do because of the things that I saw. I have worked to pull together an amazing advisory and leadership team that brings to the table 25 years of maternal health, legal expertise, and lived experience. In all that we do, we are the voice for those you don't see, those you can't see, but those you won't see. We identified a problem um, in 2019, and just like the ability to deliver with dignity, the ability to breastfeed is a right that our prisons violate every single day across this country, which is surprising because we know that breast milk provides babies with comfort and connection, security, trust, love. We know, too, that at-risk mothers and their children are economically penalized when we violate, revoke, and fail to support the right to pump. Wow, that's six. In 2019, we posted one image on the RJI Instagram page seeking donations for breast pumps, and we went viral. Mommy groups, women groups, they all wanted to donate. And by the end of that month, my office looked like Breast Pump Depot. <laughs> but then we realized there's another problem. We have one state prison, and we have caregivers that are three and a half, four hours away that don't have the ability to come pick up that breast milk. And so we thought, how are we going to address this? Our response was to create Boober, a one-of-a-kind, start-to-finish solution and service where we educate and train, we provide the supplies, we can transport and engage. We are a solution for correctional institutions. We are a solution for incarcerated mothers. We are a solution for communities and caregivers. But how did we get here tonight? Because I took this snarky idea and then COVID hit and we applied to SIL and we got accepted. And in these past six months that have flown by, we've achieved some amazing milestones in addition to collaborating with some of the most talented leaders that you've heard from tonight. But what brings us here tonight is our next steps. We invite you to join us as we launch our front end, as we launch our pilot, but as we also look at national replication. What we know, what we learn, and what we do has national legislative and advocacy implications. At Reproductive Justice Inside and Boober, we know that breastfeeding is a human right, but it is also the right to parent with dignity. 
Uber. We are a service, a solution, a brand, and a movement. We are Boober, the next breast thing. Thank you. hasn't fully kicked in yet. You go to the bathroom, you take care of your business, and you reach down for toilet paper, and it's all out. We've all been there. You think, oh crap. At home, you're left calling out to a family member, at work, a coworker. It's awkward, it's uncomfortable, but mostly it's just inconvenient. For those of us who are menstruators, this is the problem we face any time we get our period. At home, products are in hard to access drawers, and on the go, forget about it. If a dispenser like this does exist, it's often out of use, out of stock, or requires a quarter. And I don't know about you, but it's 2022, and I'm not carrying around a quarter. <laughs> Period. <laughs> That's where Tampal comes in. We're a products and services company aimed at making it easy for menstruators to access their products both at home and on the go, with the vision of ending period shame and stigma once and for all. I began to dig into this issue a little bit deeper, and I learned that one in four students in the United States cites missing class due to lack of access to period products. Obviously a much larger issue than my own tampon being out of reach. So I started talking to middle schoolers and high schoolers. I heard things like, I supplement my pads with wads of toilet paper, and really insightful things from 11 year olds, like dispensers should be gender neutral and free, and really sad things like, <laughs> I trust my body not to leak at school, which for any menstruator in the audience, you know you simply don't have control over this. So why now? When I started Tampal, there were eight states in the US that legally required that free product dispensers be in school bathrooms. And I'm really excited to say that Maryland will be our 10th in our upcoming school year. Yes, we're Maryland. also have similar laws. It's fair to say that this is not a passing trend, but a growing global movement. So what's Campbell up to? We have three products in development, our at-home dispenser, our period product locator app, and our commercial and school dispenser. Our at-home dispenser is the first of its kind professionally designed dispenser to be accessible from the toilet home. It's slick, it's clean, and specifically designed for tampons, pads, menstrual cups, and period underwear. Our period product locator app aims to connect college students with locations on campus where they can access free products. We plan to launch a pilot of this this upcoming summer in conjunction with the student-led period advocacy group Wings on the Johns Hopkins campus. We also have our commercial dispenser in development. This was specifically designed to schools in mind with easy view windows so that it's you know, attractive for a young menstruator. They can see what the products are in it. And none of those pesky mechanical buttons that often fail. Imagine if toilet paper was connected, was trapped behind a button that often failed. When we look across our competitors, Tampa is the only one breaking down stigma with easy view windows, at the same time making access more equitable by being product brand agnostic. We're also always looking for new ways to innovate, demonstrated by the first of its kind at-home dispenser and period locator app. Boop, boop. Our target market to begin with, are there's 10 <laughs> states where, we, where their schools are still working to implement solutions and those early adopter homes. But this is just the start. As more states adopt these period product laws and and Tampal at home becomes as popular as a toilet roll paper holder, we know this market will continue to expand. Our revenue model is simple. 
We are going to sell our school dispenser for $100 per dispenser, our at home for $25, and use ad revenue to sustain our locator app. We're going to go to market first in schools, partnering with those that have expressed interest in helping us pilot this better dispenser, then to larger school purchasing groups to be an approved vendor. We're going to launch our at home on our e-commerce site and niche e-commerce sites that align with our mission. And we're currently approaching leaders of student period advocacy groups across universities in the United States. This is our amazing team of period product innovators, one sitting four rows back, we have extensive experience in manufacturing, programming, design, and R&D. What started in a nuisance in my own bathroom in 2018 is now a physical prototype for the at-home that's in testing, an app that will soon be on a college campus near you, and a commercial dispenser in design. While we would love for all of you to fund our first round of at-home manufacturing, we have a simpler ask for you today, and Adiola already briefed you on this exercise. So if you'd like to pull out your phone, we'd love for you to scan our QR code and join our period community today. Because here at Tampal, we believe that tampons and pads should be as accessible as toilet paper and bathrooms. Period. All right, thank you so much, Erica, and I cannot wait to sign up to follow your prog progress and the release dates for your product lines, period, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I would like to take a few moments to recognize some really incredible individuals. First and foremost, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our healthcare heroes right here in the Johns Hopkins Hospital community, right here walking past us in, this hall, in these hallways. So please give it up for our incredible healthcare heroes during 2020 and beyond. I'd also like to take a moment. On Tuesday next week, approximately seven days from now, is Teacher Appreciation Day. I'd like to take a moment to recognize all of the current and veteran educators that are here tonight joining us online. If you are an educator or do any type of caregiver capacity, serve and support students, if you could please raise your hand so we can appreciate and acknowledge you. Woo, 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 woo. And finally, next week also marks the beginning of Mental Health Awareness Month. And if there's one thing I learned from being an entrepreneur in the social impact space, it's that burnout impacts social innovators at a pretty serious rate. For those of you who are advocating for social change, advocating for social impact, you have to remember to prioritize your mental health and well-being so that you can continue leading and serving and supporting the communities that you're in. So for everyone that's here, please take a moment to recognize and bring awareness around the importance of mental health to reduce that stigma, especially for our social innovators. Thank you for that. Awesome. And that concludes our presentations tonight. So we hope you have been watching carefully and have decided which team that presented tonight that you would like to select for the Audience Choice Award. Now this has never happened in the history of the Social Innovation Lab. This is first time ever, People's Choice, which is so, it, it's like my Ryan Seacrest moment. That's what I said to Madison. I'm like, <laughs> So please pull out your phones and vote. So you can either scan the QR code uh, on the back of tonight's program, or you can go to slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O, and type in, it's today's date. So it's 04-26-2022. Here is the QR code also. So voting actually opens at 6.30. It's open now, we've gone live. We've gone live, America, all right. So please pull out your phones, please vote. Please know that your vote makes a difference to vote for your favorite team tonight. I now have a very important part in our program. Now this person is quite literally the unsung hero of the Social Innovation Lab. This incredible individual 
has not only doubled the funding that's been available to our social innovators, but she has been a mentor, a thought partner, someone who is so flexible and exemplifies grace under pressure. So I would like to introduce the SIL hero of the evening, Madison Marks, and I know there's also a surprise from her cohort as well. So I'd like to also um, introduce Adiola. Would you like to come up for... <laughs> She's like, wait, is this in the... <laughs> for this moment, because I just would like the audience as well, and for all our folks on Zoom, if you can sound off in the chat, please congratulate Madison Marks for running yet another incredible Social Innovation Lab cohort. Hello, everyone. Can y'all hear me? Can y'all hear me? Is it on? Yes. Oh, I couldn't hear myself. Hi, everyone. Um, so, Kim actually had the amazing idea of bringing flowers for Madison. And I want to um, speak on the back, behalf of all of our cohort on talking about how awesome Madison is. So Kim, go ahead. Thank you. Madison, this is just one small thing. I wish we could have done more, but you have been with us for this last six months. You have shepherded us. You have nagged us. You have berated us. And you have encouraged us. And this cohort experience has been amazing, but it's been largely because of you. Your voice, your talent, your passion, your commitment to all of us has just been incredible. You made this the best cohort experience that we could have asked for. We love you. If I could hire you away, I would. <laughs> Vote Boober, Madison Salary, just saying. Um, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, but Madison, we love you, and you made this the best experience we could have ever asked for, and we thank you. And we cannot believe that the six, this six months is done. Um, I think we would all stay longer with you because you are just a wealth of information, a font of encouragement, and you are somebody that we admire and love greatly. So thank you so very much from the 2020 SIL cohort. Well, this was unexpected. Thank you so much. I, um, yeah, I don't <laughs> know what to say. Um, to the cohort, it has been an incredible experience. Um, I am so appreciative. This cohort has been uh, a journey, so can I have? <laughs> I've been a bridesmaid enough times. I should also. Um, so, by the way, while we're ad-libbing, please be voting. Um, so in, it has been quite an experience from one where I was joined by a social design fellow, Sam, who was starting her own business and then we had an opportunity for them to join and they've added a lot to the cohort. Um, we've had a, a group of amazing individuals. I, um, when we did the application period this year, we just knew. We had people who came, who came back um, after reapplying. They showed us that they wanted to be in the cohort. They showed us the effort, um, and they're here tonight. And we had those who were willing to take. I, I also want to recognize there's one other member of the cohort um, that I want to recognize. Holden, you're here tonight. So we want to say thank you um, for all of the work. Um, our last team couldn't pitch tonight, but they have been doing a lot of important work here in Baltimore. And so, guys, thank you all for the work you're doing, for how you show up to encourage one another on everything from your businesses to dating. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I'm really, really excited for the friendships that are coming out of this. And so, and I'm still here, as I said, wherever, you know, wherever you are, even in 10 years, I'm here to be your cheerleader. So. Okay, so where are we at with time? Um, so we did have one guest who is unfortunately stuck in traffic. So I'm doing something a little bit untraditional and asking Danny to come to stage. 
Um, so Danny is an alumni of our program from last year. I also want to recognize there's others in the audience who are alumni from last year. So I see Galen, I see Elevated Soup's team, um, both Steve's, I see, Jeff, are you here? Okay. So anyone else from last year? No, I know we have some online. So um, congratulations, guys. I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't have you on stage last year, but we're still rooting for you. Um, but Danny, can you join us? Um, I just want you to give a little bit, if you could say it like two, three minutes, what, ha what did you learn and have you taken forward from the Social Innovation Lab since last year? Okay. And, and just for context, Danny is the, uh, so Danny and her husband, Mike, um, founded Rich Restoring Inner City Hope, which is serving middle school students um, and families in the Cherry Hill neighborhood of South Baltimore. So Danny, I'll, I'll give you two or three minutes of remarks. <laughs> Hi, all. She knows to continually say two or three minutes because I will talk. Um, <laughs> this is totally off the cuff, but um, when we started SIL, well, a little bit before, my husband and I were just doing community events and decided that we probably should have a physical space and offer some community support that the community had been asking for in our eight years that we had been giving back to Cherry Hill. Um, when we knew it was time to kind of get a little serious, we started to apply for cohorts, um, pressured by our lovely friend Troy, um, to do so. And what happened was we, SLI, SIO, sorry. Okay. My job does the SLI thing, sorry. Um, Hopkins accepted us and we started and um, we would go to the classes, everything for us was virtual, and I was a frustrating gong that continually said, I don't know what to do for back office. I don't know what to do for back office. I don't even know what that looks like. Um, Madison hung in there with me, and um, in the six months that we were in the cohort, we raised over $150,000 for our center. Um, thank you. I learned I was a grant writer, um, but not only that, um, past that during this time for us last year we met um, a lot of philanthropy leadership and we are now aside from that money and continual money that we've received we are also now um, funded by T. Rowe Price and the Weinberg um, Foundation which came through connections through this cohort right here and when Madison talks about that she will be here in 10 years next year whenever she is really telling a truth because a lot of the things that we have done and are continuing to do are because of emails and phone calls and dinners and talks with Madison about other opportunities that are out there. Um, I'm excited for what I've seen on this stage and for what I saw on screen last year. Um, Baltimore is a city full of social innovation and we're a city that needs to be innovated socially. And I think that this is a great place for you to be, whether it was this year or last year. Um, or next year so just know that the even if it didn't all click for me a big thing was I kept leaving classes kind of still scrambling and then when I was able to take a breath I actually saw how things started to really fall into place and come together so if you're like me and you're graduating today and you're like I mean I think I can do it trust me it's folded into you and it's just gonna take a little more baking in the oven for you to really really see the gifts that you have received while in this program. That's all. Okay, are we ready for some prize announcements? Yeah? Okay. Audience Choice Award is still open, so if you have not voted, I'm giving you two and a half extra minutes while I'm announcing the cohort prizes. So, um, I'm getting texts from our amazing uh, committee who is monitoring the voting, Maddie and Josh. We have over 200 votes. So um, I'm not announcing that right now. I'm announcing our cohort prize process. So today I have the honor of introducing our cohort prize winners. At the end of our cohort experience, we sat down as a group with a small panel of our advisors and voted together who should receive the cohort prize. The results of that vote, which reward those teams who have made substantial progress, have a strong plan for their future, 
and clear potential for impacts in our community is finally available. Thanks to our generous supporters, we we're able to award over $40,000 tonight. So, are we ready for our cohort prize announcement? Can I get a drum roll? We're starting with third place. So, in third place, for $5,000, which can make a big impact, um, this goes to a, a winner that loves contra dancing, ran for Baltimore mayor in 2020, and didn't fly until the age of 27. We have Grass Baltimore. Congratulations, Dante. Great. Congratulations. Great. Okay. So you know, I emailed, uh, I emailed our finance department and I said, is there regulations around who can sign a giant fake check? And they said, it doesn't matter. So I signed it. Um, okay, so for second place, um, with an award amount of $15,000. The second place winner goes to a founder that loves to crochet and knit as a form of art therapy for herself makes really delicious pasta dishes, and is a certified Reiki practitioner. But more importantly, uh, she is transforming work. So let's give her a round of applause for Nikki with the Puzzling Disorder Project, part of HTE Designs Co., which is what I wrote on the check. <laughs> Okay, first prize. So, long anticipated, our award of $25,000, uh, made possible by, by Johns Hopkins Technology Ventures this year. Um, I'm not going to keep all of you waiting, but can I get a drum roll again? Great. Okay, first plot prize is someone that is a trained ballerina, art model, entrepreneur, and trauma survivor. Congratulations, Tide Courtney from Ballet After Dark. Congratulations. Um, what I shared with my cohort family last week while I was traveling during the pitch is that for years I've facilitated this organization by myself and we just had an incredible opportunity which means that a lot more eyes are about to be on us and this is going to help me make sure that I have the staffing to make sure that I can continue to provide these resources. Um, Thank you for believing in me, y'all, and recognizing how I've been out here pounding this pavement because your girl been busy. <laughs> I've been busy, and um, I am honored to be growing into a space where healing is becoming synonymous with Ballet After Dark. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Okay.
Okay, great. Our Audience Choice Award has been delivered. So, with that said, congratulations to our cohort prize winners. And I'm going to ask Tide Courtney to stay in heels for a couple more minutes. While Dana, com <laughs> while Dana comes up and announces our Audience Choice Award and closes out the evening. So, Dana. I really do dare all of y'all to roll up to the bank and try to deposit your big giant check and see what they do. <laughs> is this it right here? Right. And the, oh wow, so the ink is still drying, it just has been decided. All right, I have the pleasure of announcing today's Audience Choice Award. Remember, this is the first time ever that we have given $2,500 in a live voting poll, both in person and online. Thank you for being a part of this decision. The award winner is, congratulations, Tampel. <laughs> I've always wanted to present a giant check. Congratulations to all of our SIL teams who presented today. I want to also recognize really the key ingredient to this success, and that's all of you, the support system. That's those of you watching online, those of you who are here live, those of you who are there for us for the highs, but also for the lows. For the ones who answer the phone call from upstate New York when you're in tears when a deal falls through. <laughs> Those of us who hold our hand and do deep breathing exercises when the business website crashes. Those of you who deliver necessary supplies when your water heater breaks on Christmas and you don't have any heat. All of you are the reason this is possible. All of you are the true ripple of impact. So please, please, please know how much we appreciate you, how grateful we are for you to be a part of this network. And this marks the end of today's SIL Showcase event. Congratulations to all of our hardworking teams. Congratulations to all of our alumni in this community. And for all of our in-person attendees, I have the best news to announce. We invite you to join us for a reception provided by SIL alums, the incredible Mira Kitchen Collective outside. Right? Woo! I know, they're delicious. So to everyone online, thank you all so much for joining us. And remember, you can create positive ripples of impact in Baltimore and beyond. I hope you take to heart our call to take care of one another in this city, which nourishes and challenges us daily. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this community. And to any alumni in the audience, please come and join us on stage for a photo. Thank you so much.